завершить наше пленарное заседание. Господин Ларик Русов, зависимый сантан, исследователь автоматический. Вы как вы вас выбрали Пожалуйста. So the first generation of knowledge management 
was strongly influenced by technology. It was much more technology-based. And emphasized the individual as the unit of analysis. This turned out to be a mistake, but we didn't know it at the time. It conflated knowledge, data, and information as one thing. If, you're, if you take a look at 10 economic textbooks, go out in the bookstore, look at 10 textbooks in economics. Look up, you won't find the word knowledge in the index. Economists still don't talk about it. They think information and knowledge are the same thing. If they were the same thing, the entire world would look different. <laughs> they are very different things. But that first generation said it's all the same. And it also attempted to manage enterprise-wide knowledge, the knowledge of the whole organization. I remember being asked to work on a project for the Ford Motor Company. They said, we want to take all the knowledge in Ford, a very large company, and put it in one gigantic database. They spent almost a billion dollars trying to do that. And of course, they could have given the money to charity. It would have been a much better use of the funds. It, was, it can't be done as some of you have already mentioned. So that first generation failed. I was part of it, I failed too. We all were part of it because we didn't know what we were doing. It was all trial and error. This led to a second generation of knowledge management, which began to understand that the word knowledge had, had to do a great deal of heavy lifting. The word means a number of things that is all compressed into one word. On one hand, we have formulas, codified knowledge, things you can write down, eight contextual formulas, algorithms, descriptions. We call it know what. But on the other hand, we have deep, rich, contextual understanding and meaning, which we call know how. An organization like Rosada is filled with people with deep, know-how of atomic energy. It couldn't be all written down. It can't all be documented. It's experiential, and a great deal of it probably undocumentable. So we began to realize that when you talk about knowledge management, you're talking about two things, two parts of a spectrum. On one end is documented knowledge. On the other end is deep, rich, contextual understanding. And that became very confusing. A lot of organizations at that point began to say, look, this is too much for us. Let's just manage documents. We can put them in a database. We can derive a taxonomy. And boom, we'd be managing knowledge. People tell me, if we buy SharePoint, we'll have knowledge management. Microsoft was very happy to hear that, but of course, it's not true. And then we'd have a greater emphasis, that second generation, on a very important point that we've all learned, we meaning the collectivity of practitioners and researchers. And that is that knowledge is profoundly social. It's not a factor of individuals, it's a factor of groups of people. Individuals have separate memories, but they don't really have separate knowledge. It's a very important thing we've learned. Some philosophers had known this going back to the 19th century. But generally, that knowledge wasn't available. So there began to be a much greater emphasis on networks, communities, and practices. Much greater emphasis on those things. And I'd say today that that's the correct unit of analysis when you want to work with knowledge in any organization. Networks, communities, practices, things along that line. That's the only that much smaller. The third generation, which is going on today, is a greater emphasis on the local, the local nature of knowledge. Knowledge, if I had to say so, is local, contextual, and sticky. The most important knowledge in any organization is the knowledge on the ground. The workers, the people actually doing the work, have the most critical knowledge because they're doing the work. We all need leaders, we all need executives, we all need managers, but they know less about the work than the people doing the work. Knowledge is local. Knowledge is contextual. It's deeply dependent on the environment it's in. 
someone once said, what you know is deeply dependent on where you stand. And that's very true. And knowledge is sticky. It's very hard to move around. It's not easy. Knowledge transfers one of the most difficult tasks you can do in knowledge. And we've also learned that in large organizations, like Rosada, like any of the organizations, most of the organizations they work with, they're globally distributed, which means the knowledge is globally distributed, which means it's very hard to find ways to move that knowledge around effectively. Knowledge is a very expensive thing. It costs a great deal of money and time for a person to develop real knowledge, real know-how of a subject. And to move it around without moving the person is one of the great tasks of knowledge productivity. So this is all words. Let us talk about some examples. Next slide. So I've been working for the last 25 years as a senior knowledge advisor for NASA, the space agency. A lot of NASA now does work with Russia. Strong relationship. It's the first U.S. agency that actually took knowledge seriously, uh, for good reason. <laughs> they really had to. And their first emphasis was on transferring knowledge internally. They have 13 centers within the United States. Many of these centers have innovative practices. They do things differently. And to move that knowledge around is very, very difficult. We tried writing documents. We tried all sorts of technology. And we found, after a lot of experiment, that without a doubt, the most effective way to transfer innovative practices within the center was to have people tell stories to one another, narratives, stories. We bring them together. We teach people how to speak. I can't read. My eyes aren't good enough. <laughs> Too old. It's OK. Two minutes. A few minutes. I'll, I'll wrap up. <laughs> Don't get older. You can't read that one. So we learn how to do this. NASA, too, has too much knowledge. They realized, and this was a hard lesson for them to absorb, they couldn't go it alone. They could not do all the things they want to do just by being NASA. They had to collaborate with Russia. They had to collaborate with Brazil, with, other, with India, with Japan. You no longer can go it alone, as my friend from Elsevier said. There's too much knowledge in the world to do anything alone. And that's one of the great needs for knowledge networks, for knowledge collaboration. You can't do it alone. And there's a very last point I'll make. I'll just skip talking with the World Bank. Ron said enough about it. You can always read about it. The last point I wanted to make is NASA had to develop a model for governing knowledge. Knowledge is not self-governing. If you don't have roles, if you don't have assignments, if you don't have accountability or measurements of how successful you are, it's not going to work. It's like raising children. If you think you can raise children and not give them rules or some sort of governance, you really are out of your mind. And the same thing with organizations. So we tried to set up a federal model, a federalist model in governing knowledge of NASA. We have a central office in Washington, but each of the 13 centers has their own chief knowledge officer. And they run it together in a federal model, meeting a few times a year, discussing common issues, rather than a central type of management structure. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>